Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me on this Tuesday, August 4th edition of Bang the Book Radio. My name is Adam Burke, your host for the next 25 minutes or so as we chat with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. We'll talk PGA Championship, the first major of the golf season. We'll talk NHL playoffs. We'll touch very quickly on NASCAR with a back-to-back doubleheader at Michigan International Speedway here this weekend. Over at bangthebook.com, daily MLB picks and tips article. You can find that every morning over at the website. Doing some NHL game preview stuff for you for the playoffs. Covering golf, UFC, NASCAR, Charles J on the NBA for us. Doing everything we can over there with a little bit of a skeleton crew as we still try to get back into form here after all this COVID stuff. But make sure you head on over to bangthebook.com and check all of that out. As you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB and the number 200 is that promo code, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest on the Tuesday program here, as always, and that is Jack of All Trades, Brian Blessing of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, Adam. Uh, the hockey has been spectacular. Loving this. Uh, it's like it's March Madness for hockey. It's amazing. Well, and I haven't watched a whole lot of it, but a lot of people, the returns for the NBA have been pretty good too. A lot of faster paced games, a lot of uh, you know pretty crisp play. So good to get these sports back here. Major League Baseball still kind of figuring out a way to survive, I guess, uh, with a couple of teams that have had the big outbreaks. But other than that, they've done okay. NHL, no positive tests. They've done a fantastic job, and it also seems like we've, you know, kind of run out of positive tests for the PGA Tour here, too. Haven't heard of too many guys getting COVID, having to withdraw, all that kind of thing, and we've got the PGA Championship here this week at TPC Harding Park, and before we get into the players and the odds and all of that, it sounds like it's going to be pretty feisty here this weekend. Oh, I, I think this is going to be a spectacular golf tournament. The PGA every year uh, is one of these deals where literally there'll be a guy, you know, uh, not a no-name, but a long shot uh, that will be in contention. But uh, clearly the favorites, the golf is in, in such a great place. With Justin Thomas, 13 career wins at age 27. Kepka's won four of the last eight majors, played well last week. Yeah, you got to put him right at the top of the list again this week. McElroy runs hot and cold. Brahms, the world number one. DeChambeau's a polarizing guy. Shoffley's a terrific player. He had one bad hole last week. He's capable. Uh, Dustin Johnson, if he's healthy. Uh, Webb Simpson is playing great golf. And, of course, Tiger Woods is back. And then haven't even gone. I go to the next 20, 30 guys that are in here with a shot. Well, and as you look at this course here this week, they're saying that they narrowed the fairways. The rough is expected to be pretty high, not just, you know, if you go really errant with your tee shot, but the first cut expected to be some thick lettuce there too. So I kind of looked at guys that are strokes gained off the tee. I looked at some longer shots that have some driving accuracy, guys that, you know, put it in the fairway, will be able to get in close proximity to these greens. You know, this isn't a U.S. Open. The U.S. Open is almost relentless in nature. And last year's PGA at Bethpage Black was pretty relentless too, but there's usually some give and take. You know, if the fairways are going to be narrow, the greens and the pin placements are a little bit better. If the rough is going to be thick, the angles at the pin are going to be a little bit better. There's always a little bit of give and take because this is the PGA signature event. They don't want to go out there and embarrass these guys. So I think the greens may play a little bit fairer here, uh, even though we've got kind of that bent grass and POA combination. But, you know, with the narrow fairways, with the thick rough, I think you got to put it in the short grass here this week. Well, with Brendan Todd then, the 125-1, to 1, and clearly he's in contention all the time. It's just a question of kicking the door down at the end. He, he won some of the smaller tier events back-to-back weeks, but when he stares down the big boys, as we saw this past week, it, it gets a little dicey, and there's no knock on him. The guy's playing great golf, but all he does uh, is hit fairways. Um, uh, that being said, uh, this course is a par 70. So when you get a par 70, that means you're only getting two par fives. And that brings a lot of the field into the equation because it 
you know, the Bombers, literally, I mean, they're upset if they don't go four under on the four par fives every round. And now they're only two par fives. So it brings a lot of guys into the equation. I'll tell you guys in the equation for me this week, and you and I were both on him last week, and he played well. He just, as you said, you know, in the open there, had that one bad hole. I'm back on Xander Shoffley this week. I mean, Xander Shoffley has been very, very good off the tee. He was on the plus side in strokes gained with the putter last week, but also excellent in strokes gained around the green. And I think if you run into a scenario here this week where the rough plays as anticipated, Guys are going to have to chip. Guys are going to have to pitch and flop and put themselves somewhere close enough to make par because I think par will be a good score on a lot of these holes. Shoffley scrambles well. He plays well off the tee. If he putts well enough, this is the week for him, I think. I got, yeah. Oh, no. I, I like Shaw. I was all over Shoffley last week and he, he took an eight on a par four and that was it. Uh, other than that, he was solid the whole weekend. But honestly, you know, Bill Mickelson at 80-1. to 1. Uh, if, if Mickelson on Sunday, the crazy thing is, everybody spit the bit at the end. And Mickelson needed to come out of the gate and go low, and he always does that. And he started with pars and then got it together at, t- at the tail end and only ended up a few shots short. But listen, Mickelson at 80-1 to 1 is not a crazy play. I mean, he's actually in really good form. Yeah, I didn't look at too many long shots here for this one. I, I like Webb Simpson at 28-1. to 1. I think that's a pretty good price on him. He hits a ton of fairways. Very, very good across the board in strokes gained all over the place. I think Daniel Berger's a pretty good play at 40-1, to 1 too. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting, and, and maybe this will kind of you know lead into your handicap a little bit here, is that I saw Justin Thomas, uh, uh, somebody said on Twitter this morning, that Thomas looked at the yardage book for this thing and mentioned that there's like four or five dogleg lefts. And he's like, well, I better learn how to draw the ball over the next couple of days. So yeah. guys with that shot shape, you know, that may kind of play uh, you know, to their strengths a little bit as well. No, and, and honestly, if he, you know, he says that on the front end, I give him credit for, for being honest. You know, all those years, as great a golfer as Lee, uh, um, Lee Trevino was, uh, he just had no shot at the Masters because the the majority of the holes at the Masters are dog leg lefts, and he plays a cut. And he, he just he had no shot. He walked in there knowing he had no shot. If Thomas is even broaching that subject, uh, believe me, I, I wouldn't be worried about him having to play a draw if he had to play a draw. He's that good. But interesting that he would, you know, even broach that subject. The only long shot I did take a look at here, and I've seen him as high as two hundred to one out there in the marketplace is Cameron Champ, and and that's largely just because Cameron Champ is a monster off the tee. He was third in strokes gained off the tee last week at TPC Southwind. He's second for the season on the PGA Tour, and like I said, I think this is a week where, you know, for the most part, a lot of these tournaments lately have been about the irons. They've been about strokes gained approach. This week, it's a little more tailored towards strokes gained off the tee. We mentioned driving accuracy with a guy like Brendan Todd. But Cameron Champ's a guy that can put it out there and can do so fairly accurately. So Cameron Champ is a guy I think is a decent shot, 200-1. to one. But again, you don't have to pick the winner necessarily. You can play matchups. You can play top 20, top 30, all those types of things. And, and maybe that's a good opportunity here for this week as well. Well, from a I'm, listen, I I'm not, won't waste a lot of time on it. I, I think you got to go very much with Kepka here. Uh, I think him coming up just short this past week actually was a good thing for him. He's won four of the last eight majors. He's all about majors. And, you know, the knees was a little is a bit of an issue. You don't know week to week. But he's he's just built for majors. He's, he's just steely-eyed. He's gutsy. I mean, of the favorites, you know, Kepka certainly to me is at the very much at the top of the list. The From the bomb perspective, like Michael Thompson at 141, I'm playing three guys. Uh, Michael Thompson at 140 to one. Uh, you know he was in contention at the Heritage, the RBC Heritage. I mean, in with a chance to win late, um, and then he comes up and he wins the 3M Open, gets into the uh, WGC event this past week, and he shoots 70-74 
you know, after getting a win uh, that's, you know, kind of life changing for the guy. But on the weekend, he shoot six, uh, excuse me, he shot 69 69. But the guy's just in really, really good form. And I think that's a massive disrespect, that number from a form perspective for a, a guy that's playing well. That's worth it to me. And then I'm, I'm taking a flyer here. And Adam Scott has not been seen or heard from since this pandemic started. He said, I'm, I'm going to Australia, and I'm not doing the PGA Tour. I'm not doing the week-to-week thing. I want to see how this all, all pans out. We have no idea, but I rest assured he was in Australia working on his game. And Adam Scott... Uh, coming out of the President's Cup in the spring, was playing phenomenal golf. His ball striking is just exceptional. And the one thing is, you know, for years with the with the tall putter, I don't even know if you call them belly putters anymore. You can't anchor it. But P- Adam Scott can putt again. And I just think he is just so much out of sight, out of mind. A- at 60 to 1, I just think it's a gong show price. I, I mean, I, you know. I, I cl- clearly would put him, you know, the, I think the price, it's it's baked in the cake here that he hasn't been playing competitively. But, I mean, he'd be right there with a Cantley or, or, a, or a Webb Simpson, you know, if he'd been playing the past few weeks. I just think it's an overlay. And, and what if this guy comes out of the gate and his he brings his A game with him? Well, if nothing else, it should be a great event. And what, we've got four majors in two months, beginning with this one, I think it is. So, you know, golf has been... Kind of a saving grace here. A lot of people getting into betting golf. A lot of people have kind of transitioned away from, you know, doing Major League Baseball or some of the other professional sports to focus on golf. A lot of the modelers, a lot of the analytics crowd, the numbers crowd, a lot of the people that I follow on Twitter uh, have really gone all in with golf here. So, you know, like you said, this has been uh, as bad as everything else has been, it seems. This has been a pretty decent time for golf, and we should get an excellent major here this week. No, I think it's going to be spectacular. There'll be the matchups, and then, of course, there's a lot of enhanced offerings because, uh, you know, it's a high-profile event. You know, f- from the Europeans' perspective, uh, listen, uh, you know, Tommy Fleetwood, 50-1, to 1, you know, his game's built for majors. He's just been kind of treading water. Uh, Matthew Fitzpatrick is really close. Uh, he contended this past week. I played on him for the Masters. Ty Hatton is another guy I played for the Masters. He's 50-1. to 1. I-, I will throw one out there. Maybe I'm talking myself into a fourth guy here. His game is coming around. And listen, if you're a major champion, you know, you could just sit there and see them tell them, oh, you know, a second major. You know, guys win that first major and disappear for a long time. You know, Danny Willett won the Masters. Danny Willett's been showing up on leaderboards and contending. And at 150 to 1, I th- that's just a crazy price. That is an absolutely crazy price on a guy whose game is seems to be resurgent. Uh, so I actually I think I will I will I will throw one more grenade in there. I'll throw a Danny Willen in there. Yeah, kind of from that same mold. I mean, I, I sort of like Shane Lowry a little bit too. You know, a sure. guy that that kind of you know fits that same mold, has that major win under his belt and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think he's eighty to one or so, but he's played you know pretty well since the restart. Played well last week too, so. Maybe those are a couple more guys we could take a look at here. For the it, it, would, it, it would be interesting, and I, I have not done this. It would be cool if you, you just got an index, of, a betting, you know, you made your own betting odds index of guys in this field that with major championships. You're, what are we, you're whittling it down to what, 20 guys? Something along those lines? A guy that's yeah. got a, pre, a previous major? Something in that area, maybe? Yeah, I would say, so. you know what, I actually looked at this. Um, I looked at this yesterday. And I'll see if I can bring it up here as we transition over to the NHL, and I'll just sort of throw it in as a sidebar. But the NHL playoffs, I mean, look, not only has the bubble concept worked, and we talked about that last week with no positive tests now for the last two weeks in the NHL, but the playoffs, you know, while things haven't been as smooth as possible in terms of the gameplay, we've had some blowouts, some teams that look ready, other teams that kind of don't. The hockey's been great. The pace has been excellent. I watched Blue Jackets and Maple Leafs the other night, and it looked like a playoff game. Up and down, full go, full speed, nothing-nothing game into the third period. It was excellent. It was great to watch, and 
I missed it. And it seems like, you know, so far the NHL with some really positive returns here with the restart. No, there's no doubt. And I will say this, and we talked about this for months, that there were going to be teams that would go up there and you'd say, yeah, they don't look like they're into it. And for the most part, the majority of them are. Uh, I would I would say to you, uh, the teams that don't look like they're into it, uh, Vancouver looked uh, pretty disinterested for whatever reason. Florida, uh, just the Islanders are a frustrating team, but Florida looks pretty disinterested. And the break, and can they turn it around? Uh, they're that good, yes. And I, I don't think the round robin is that big a thing. But I think the Bruins were just pissed to be there. They had the President's Trophy locked up. Now they're in this thing, uh, and they may end up being the number three seed. Uh, but for the most part, these guys have showed up with passion. I think the quality of play has been re- exceptionally good. Better, I thought it would take some a few games to shake rust off. The skill guys are being the skill guys. The grit guys are you know bringing it. And uh, honestly, I mean, Columbus, I know I talked about Columbus on this show for a long uh, I've been talking about them since mid-March, that – Toronto's defense is sketchy, and Columbus is just going to come back with that feeling of, hey, we did it to Tampa Bay, and it's a fresh start, and they get Seth Jones back, and they're just playing a north-south game. Uh, Teams like Columbus and the Islanders. And and the one other I'll say that I had so many people, and it was one of these deals where everybody was on one side, and I'm like, man alive, for the life of me, I just didn't get it. Everybody was talking up the Rangers to me. And I, Carolina is just a team. They're a close knit team, and I, I think I think any one of those three teams I mentioned can win a few series. Um, you know, I go. I, and the funny thing is, the reason I played Carolina was I was watching the game that night when both goalies got hurt and the Zamboni driver came in, and the way they played against the Leafs that one night, you know, nothing burger regular season game. They rallied around that goalie, and, I mean, Toronto couldn't even get it across the red line. And I made a mental note that night. I said, these guys are tight. They are a close-knit group. And this is the time of year where, you know, other teams may have the better players, but I think being close-knit matters, and uh, Carolina fits that bill for me, too. 22 major champions in the in the PGA Championship field here this weekend. Well, there you but go. But that includes a guy like Rich Beam. Uh, sure. Sean Michelle's another one. So, you know, really, you know, 20 guys. But, um, you know, when you look at the NHL here, and you know, the, the thing about that Carolina and the Rangers series is this, and I did write a preview up for that game over at bangthebook.com tonight for game three. Carolina in the minus 140 to minus 145 range. You know, Henrik Lundqvist was not good during the regular season. And maybe this is sort of a nod to him. Maybe he rides off into the sunset after this. I don't know. But, a lot of people that were betting the Rangers expected Igor Shosturkin to be in there. And I know we talked about that last week, where we thought that the Rangers would probably end up going with him. Lundqvist hasn't been the problem. It's not his fault that they're down 2 no. nothing. No. They have not played well offensively. And Carolina well, no. has been the better team. Everybody but, was playing a goalie. They were all playing yeah. a goalie. And then the day of the game, the goalie say he comes up hurt. Um, but, you know, that being said, I, I, I think, and that would be a, a pretty – uh, interesting tell here. I'm just checking the time of their game. Well, it's they don't not the, play until eight. I, yeah, I haven't seen anything uh, about Shesterkin yet. I mean, is this no, series no, over tonight, though? Yeah, uh, no. Any series that's two zero get, gets closed out. I, I don't see it. it listen, there have been in the history of the NHL when they did best of fives, uh, teams that were down two zero. All right, the the if a team goes up two zero. The record is fifty-five and one. That oh, in in the history of the NHL, in a best of five, you're up 2 55 and one. More teams have come down, come back from o three uh, in a best of seven than teams that come back from o two in a best of five. I uh, you know the, the and the crazy thing is the impact that that would have too is uh, the Rangers uh, have. Uh, Carolina's first round pick. So if Carolina wins, the odds of getting the, the first round, first overall pick, uh, that gets goes from one one and eight to one and seven now because they'll just move that first round pick to next year. So I mean that actually has impacts on uh, you know uh, getting the stud kid coming out of hockey in the draft too. 
Now, you mentioned Vancouver, and, and just, you know, they didn't look very good in game one. I mean, they did not play well at all. They're back in action here tonight. This is the late game, 1045 Eastern time on USA Network. So right in prime time for you. The big question for Minnesota coming into the playoffs was goaltending. You know, Devin Dubnik did not play well at all during the regular season. Alex Stalock winds up getting the role as the starter and then pitches a shutout in game one. What do you expect from Vancouver here tonight? Do you think they bounce back and even it up? Well, if they care, this is the game in the entire tournament. You're going to get their best effort if they care. Um, they just look completely frustrated. A handful of guys, you know, Besser played pretty hard. Pedersen was really a non-factor, and you know, that was a kid you're thinking in this kind of format could be dominant, and he was invisible. Um, Minnesota's a sneaky team, and Staylock's a good goalie. Um, so, and it's not like we haven't seen this kind of stuff in the past. I mean, whole Grubauer was a starting goalie for Washington. You know, hope he comes in and wins the cup. You know, the one year Crawford couldn't stop a basketball like last night in the first round, Darling came in, saved their bacon, and then Crawford came back and they won the cup. Where, where did, where did, uh, you know, whoever heard of Jordan Bennington before last year, you know? This is this tournament is like, why not an Alex Stalock? You know, who knows? Well, and as we look at Wednesday here, you mentioned the Boston Bruins. And, you know, I've kind of tried to shy away from these round robin games because I just, they, they kind of look like glorified scrimmages to me. It's sort of hit or miss as to whether or not these teams care all that much about these games and about seeding and all that. But Tampa Bay and Boston do meet Wednesday afternoon. That's a four o'clock Eastern time puck drop. Boston, a slight favorite out there in the market. I mean, do you think that they want to try and you know get rid of some of these bad habits and get some positive momentum going into the first round? Or do you think they just keep going through the motions? I don't know. They looked horrible in the exhibition game, and they got mauled in their, in their regular game. Um, I think when push comes to shove and you know an opponent, you're playing the same guys night after night after night, and the thing officially starts – it would have shocked me if Boston flips a switch. No, but at the moment, they they look to be completely disinterested. And, you know, the, the funny thing, uh, you know, you were talking about the majority of these games have been played to the under. Uh, save Chicago, Edmonton, where, you know, they'd actually the total was six and a half last night, and, the, the you know, that, that flew over the total of both of those games. That series is pond hockey, but it is something we talked about throughout the course of um, uh, uh, the the lead up to this. You know, Colorado St. Louis played an incredible game, one nothing. The goal scored with point one seconds left. Uh, but you saw the Vegas Dallas game, where you're sitting there going, "This is a one nothing game." If you ever seen one with Leonard and Bishop, and uh, in the Boston game with Philly, you know, you. But we said the round robin games. Where's the intensity? You're not playing these guys right back. You're, you're not, you know, it's more that, that if there's a propensity for games to go over, to me, it not across the board, but generally speaking, are the round robin games because there's, there's the, the hate and the angst isn't there because you know you're going to have to play these guys in 48 hours. 24 and 4 to the under since the restart. That includes the exhibition games and then goes on into this year, but 24 and 4 to the under here so far. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of the playoff or the qualifying round games for Wednesday night real quickly here. Pittsburgh, a dollar sixty, a dollar sixty-five favorite for game three against Montreal. Carey Price has turned back the clock. He's played very, very well. Mo- Montreal's not a bad team. They just didn't get much from Price during the regular season. They won game one in overtime. They lost three to one last night. What do you think about game three here on Wednesday? Is this another low scoring affair? Uh, yeah, it's actually of all, of all the games, probably the one I'm least interested in, but I, I would say this Montreal got Pittsburgh's attention. Uh, Pittsburgh wins game two, three, one. I just think the talent disparity is, is too significant. Can price steal the game? Yes. Um, but it's likely to be Pittsburgh. I, I mean, I got like, like I was convinced Columbus at, at a dog price, um, uh, was well worth it against Toronto. Uh, the, the Canadians, to me, you're throwing a dart. You know, I, I think Pittsburgh's the better team. But, 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 you, but to your point, um, more, more likely to be an under because Price is playing well. 
But if the, but if the Penguins seize control here and, and just really just start wearing these guys down, all of a sudden these games where the total was, you know was a five and a half under, uh, certainly it could still go over. But I I think you know it's Pittsburgh to me, but uh, many better opportunities on the card. Speaking of getting a team's attention, Chicago with four goals in the first period of game one against Edmonton. That kind of seemed to wake the Oilers up. And then it was the Connor McDavid show in game two. Uh, I mean, just a ridiculous display of skill on that second goal that he had. Edmonton's a minus 135, minus 140 favorite to take a two to one lead in the series on Wednesday night. Did Chicago kind of just have their game one moment and it's pretty much over now? No. And. Uh, there were a lot of hidden things in there. The, McDavid got called out by a guy, a, a writer in on social media, saying, you know, that he, and he is, he's kind of a vanilla guy, and said that his personality rubs off on the team. And I'm on, on my radio show yesterday. I said, if, give me a, if you may give me a prop over under two and a half points for McDavid tonight after hearing that, uh, I said, I'll play that all day long. Well, he gets a hat trick. So McDavid gets a bounce and a step, and he shows up. The bottom line is there's just so much open ice, and both defenses are brutal. And, you know, the Twitter thing, you know, I I, I like it. I, you know, I, I'll throw crap out there and have fun with it and basically promote the shows and stuff. But I, I had people coming at me last night after uh, the first two periods. I even called my buddy. Uh, Chuck Esposito from Sunset Station, who's a big Blackhawks guy, and I called him. And then I said, you know what, I put it out on Twitter. Crawford was a mess. I mean, he he just he let two five-hole goals in like he didn't even know he was playing in a hockey game. I, I'm like, what, what's he doing? I, and I, I said, if, if I, and I would have done this. With all sincerity, they were down a goal. And I said, I'd bring Subban in. Uh, you know, it's a game. The game's there for the taking, but you ain't winning the game with this goalie. So I put it out on Twitter. Unlikely to happen, but might there be a Subban sighting because Crawford's a basket case? Oh, my God. Did people, they, they said, I you cover hockey for a living? You know, yikes. You know, they're, they're coming at me in waves. You know, two minutes into the period, Crawford goes behind the net, and he can't even stop a slow wraparound, and the oiler right behind him gets it and comes out front and just puts it in. Game over. You know, I'm like, and like, you know, you think maybe it should have happened now. I mean, if you can't envision stuff on the front end, you're doomed to fail. I, you know, but I, the Twitter thing is funny. Like, like they, oh, they were ripping me to shreds, and then you know, Crawford lets two more horrific goals in. I mean, if, if you want to sit there and keep, uh, you know, if, if you can't, you're watching a game and the guy's a basket case, and you're only down a goal going to the third. I don't think it would have been a crazy move at all to put the other goal in just to wake the team up. No, I don't think so either. And we'll see what the Blackhawks do here for Wednesday night. It'd probably go back to Crawford, but maybe there'll be a little bit of a shorter leash there on him with Subban ready and waiting to go. We talked NASCAR here for just a couple of minutes because we've got another one of those unique scenarios, Brian, one of those things unique to the 2020 NASCAR season, a back-to-back Saturday and Sunday up at Michigan in Brooklyn, which is just about 45 minutes or so from Detroit. This is a big track here at Michigan International Speedway. This is a two-mile oval, so the big track, and that you know certainly dictates your handicap because you don't have short track racing. You don't have you know the experience factor of racing in traffic, all those kinds of things. This week may just be about the car and about going straight in the car and not getting into any trouble. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm going uh, grenade hunting here. I mean, listen. Uh, you know Harvick up there in Hamlin and the same cast of characters. Honestly, uh, what's Blaney? Is he about 10, 12? Yeah, in that range, yeah. Well, I mean, Blaney has a fast car every week. All right? Um, you know, I know I, I, Logano's like, I know Logano and Kislowski are the same driver to me. You know, we're, if there's going to be an upsetter, you, I look at those two. But Blaney has a sick fast car and it's pit stuff or, or goofball things that happen to him he'll win he'll lead you know a third of the laps in the race winning the, the last lap is the one that matters but I, i'd look at a blaney uh but i'm, I'm going bomb hunting here I, i'm playing tyler reddick and he won here he's a rookie he won here on the xfinity uh tour last year but this kid on the mile and a half tracks uh, where there's significant braking, 
you know, and, and he almost won a few weeks back when Dylan won. He ran second. But on a, a track that this guy can be just, it's pedal to the metal and all out, and he's not afraid to run that high line and hug the wall. Uh, I just got a sneaky feeling at a big price, which and they can be rare on in the NASCAR area. Tyler Reddick is absolutely on my card this week. Seeing Tyler Reddick here at 60-1 to 1 for this weekend. And, you know, much like we talked about at Pocono back in June, with the back-to-back, I mean, watch Saturday's race. See who runs well. See who's got the good car. See who maybe, you know, has a bad pit or a pit road penalty or something like that. And let that kind of, you know, filter into your handicap for Sunday. Watch Saturday. Make a couple of plays, of course. But see how that race goes and then see if there's somebody that you want to go ahead and go out there and take on Sunday. No, it's it's a great point. Honestly, I mean, so I'll sit here and say, I think Blaney wins one of the two. How's that? If you're getting two kicks, two kicks at it, but, uh, but I, I just, I I think Reddick, I really do. I just have this bizarre feeling and then feelings, you know, bet money on this stuff. I, I mean, I think he has a chance, a sincere chance to win, win the event. Well, and then you look at next weekend, August 16th, they run at Daytona, but they run on the road course, 3.81 mile road course. First time NASCAR Cup Series has used that in, I don't even know how long, but they've got two stops at Daytona left, one on the road course, one on the big track, and then two at Dover, August 22nd and 23rd. So lots of NASCAR here over the next three weeks. Well, I, and I'll just throw this out there. It's un, it's unbelievable to watch this week in, week out. Uh, you know, mistakes the driver's making, uh, you know, bad luck. And I, I, Kyle Busch is having just a god-awful season. And, and honestly... It, it, he may need the road course to get a win here, and he's highly motivated to get a win. So that, that's a topic for next week. But I'd watch out for Kyle, uh, Kyle Bush on the road course because it ain't been working on the big tracks. Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how can people check out those two shows of yours? Uh, KSHP.com. Uh, there's a listed live function, noon to 2 Pacific weekdays. And uh, I put the links to all the shows out there for you on my Twitter at Brian Blessing. Make sure you follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Blessing. Brian, always a treat. Thank you so much for joining me, man. Really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again real soon. All right, Adam. Have a good week, bud. There you go. There's Brian Blessing. Once again, the host of Sportsbook Radio, Vegas Hockey Hotline, Hockey Betting Podcast. He's got a golf betting podcast. Plenty of stuff going on in his world. And you can check it all out on Twitter at Brian Blessing. Coming up on Thursday, we'll chat more baseball with a new edition of the Betters Box. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again on Thursday.